Oh, then he went down, kept it together. It's okay. Woo! That was a risky start. Right, good morning. Good morning to you. My name's Christopher. If we haven't met, I'm executive pastor here at Welcome Church. Ooh, yeah, come on. It's, delight, it's a delight to welcome you, especially if, you, if you're here for the first time, if it's your very first time with us. We're just happy you chose to come and spend your Sunday morning with us, um, maybe just to visit or maybe to celebrate someone who's being baptized. It is great that you're here. We hope you have a great morning and you feel really welcome. Um, and uh, I'm going to give a short talk today. Uh, now, last week, we began a new series of talks uh, in a series we've called Even Through You, where we're exploring how God takes flawed, fallible, and forgettable people and does amazing things through them for his glory. And that the idea that God is at work today, even through me, even through you. So let me start by asking you a quick question this morning. Who has had the most influence on your life? Have a think now. Who's had the most influence on your life? Now, the obvious answer, mum and dad, parents, isn't it? You know, they say life is a gradual process of turning into your parents, whether you like it or not. It just happens, isn't it? So someday you look in the mirror and you go, I'm my dad. My dad's here today. Hi, dad. Um, <laughs> you know, for better, for worse. Um, well, maybe there's someone in your life who just gave a, a certain bit of attention, they gave some input to you that you really needed at a crucial time in your life, maybe a teacher who believed in you, or a relative who invested time in you, a coach who encouraged you, maybe there's someone who, who influenced the direction of your life, or maybe you might answer this question by thinking bigger, you say, oh no, yeah, but, but you know, I, I'm, I live in the UK, and the UK has a, has a government, hasn't there? And people have shaped the direction of our country. Our government decide things like how many bank holidays we get, how much tax we pay, how much we pay for our energy. They've influenced our life, haven't they? And, you know, at her funeral last week, many commentators argued that the Queen held together our nation's identity and values over her long reign. So maybe we could say the Queen has had the most influence over our lives. Well, I, I was thinking about this question this week, and so I went to ask an expert, okay? Um, and um, I, I found an expert in the form of Tom Holland, who, whilst playing Spider-Man uh, in the Spider-Man franchise, is also a PhD historian, <laughs> author, and BBC broadcaster. A different Tom Hollands, right? Two Tom Hollands. <laughs> Two Tom Hollands, that's what I'm saying. All right. Um, he's a PhD historian, author, and BBC broadcaster. He's spent a lot of time trying to get to the bottom of this question. And his answer is absolutely fascinating. You see, Tom grew up as a liberal atheist. Okay? And he was fascinated by ancient philosophy and history. But you know, as he started to research and publish books on these ancient writers and thinkers, he began to become very uneasy. Okay, as he realized that the history that he was so fascinated by had absolutely nothing in common with his own values and ethics. He said this, he said, The longer I spent immersed in the study of classical antiquity, the more alien and unsettling I came to find it. And in 2016, he published an article in the New Statesman entitled, Why I Was Wrong About Christianity. And he wrote, it took me a long time to realize my morals are not Greek or Roman, but thoroughly and proudly Christian. And the person that Tom Holland believes is the most influential Christian author of all time is the Apostle Paul. In a 2020 interview, Holland explains that, compacted into Paul's letters are almost everything that has shaped the Western world. Ultimately, our Western values don't go back to Greek philosophers or Roman imperialism. They go back to Paul. His letters are, I think, along with the four Gospels, the most influential, the most impactful, the most revolutionary writings that have emerged from the ancient world. So there you have it. Do you believe the expert? And you can read his book, by the way. It's called Dominion, The Making of the Western Mind. I hear it's on offer uh, at certain online stores that offer same-day delivery. Um, <laughs> you can read all about it. It's an excellent book. But look, here's the point. If we believe the expert on this question 
then the person who's had the most influence on, on how we think today and our beliefs, our ethics, and our values is the Apostle Paul. When we stand up for liberty for all of the oppressed, when we champion the equal value of the poor, when we contend for law, order, and justice, when we celebrate human rights and tell our kids to share, say sorry, and forgive, when we stand up for victims, when we expect our governments to serve us and our leaders to abide by the same rules that they impose on us, when footballers take the knee to show solidarity against racism, when someone uses the Me Too hashtag, when we celebrate the NHS that it's open to all, and when we honour Her Majesty the Queen because of the way she laid down her life in service of others, we are not speaking the language of Rome or ancient Greece or of normal human behaviour, which of course doesn't exist. We are speaking the language of the Apostle Paul. That's what history tells us. So what I'm going to do today is I'm, I'm going to talk about the Apostle Paul. I'm going to talk about his life. I'm going to explore how God worked through the Apostle Paul. So I'm going to tell you, start by telling you three facts about the Apostle Paul. Okay? Fact number one. Fact number one, Paul was as Jewish as they come. Yes, you heard me right. He was Jewish and not in a casual, chilled out kind of, my parents are Jewish, but I'm not really sure kind of way. Not like that. Paul, Paul was as Jewish as they come. It affected absolutely everything in his life. He was a pure-blooded Jew, tracing his ancestry back to the 12 tribes of Israel. He was a Pharisee, which was a Jewish sect, who were basically an ultra-conservative group of Jews when it came to keeping the law of the Old Testament. He was also training as a rabbi and a religious leader, and he would have memorized much, if not all, of the Old Testament. Okay? That's quite something, isn't it? And then, and then moreover, the rest of his life, he looked Jewish. He, he dressed Jewish. He ate Jewish food. He lived with Jewish customs. He kept the Jewish Sabbath. He washed himself according to Jewish purity laws and celebrated Jewish festivals. His life was one of strict obedience to religious law. And do you know what? It was something he took immense pride in. It was. He wrote about this later in his, his, his life. He said this, If others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if ever there was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law. Without fault. Yeah. Wow. That's the kind of guy Paul is. Do you know the Jewish law has 613 commandments. And Paul said that he obeyed that law without fault. That's the sense of who he was. Fact number two. Paul hated Christians. Yes, you heard me right again. Paul hated Christians. The man who wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. He hated Christians. No, you say, oh, hate, it's a bit of a strong word, isn't it? But do you know what? It's probably not strong enough. The book of Acts in the New Testament tells the story of the first Christians and the early church. And do you know what? It's all going really well until chapter 7, when Paul's powerful friends in the Jewish council took a Christian leader called Stephen, and they put him on trial, and they were so offended by his faith in Jesus, that they dragged him out of the city and stoned him to death. And then we read these chilling verses about Paul, who also had a Hebrew name, which was Saul, in chapter 8. We read these verses about him. It says this, And Saul approved of their killing him. Yeah, he approved. He went, yeah, that's good. That's a good thing that he died. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Do you hear that? Men or women? Paul didn't care. If you were a Christian, you were guilty. And he wasn't ashamed of this. He was proud. He would have been congratulated for it by his peers. And then at the start of Acts chapter 9, we read this. Meanwhile, 
Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, who were Christians, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So you see, original Paul slash Saul was the OG. He was the original gangster. Okay, He was callous. He was pitiless. He was murderous. For Paul, the best type of Christian was a dead Christian. If Paul lived in our culture today, we would consider him nothing less than a religious extremist. And this is the guy whose words get read out at weddings? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love never fails. And that brings us to fact number three, which is that Paul's life took an unexpected turn. You see, Paul was on this journey, as we read in that last passage, from Jerusalem to Damascus. But as Paul traveled to Damascus, something happened, something inexplicable, something that has historians scratching their balding heads, something that would change Paul's life and the entire Roman world, and even world history forever. You see, Paul left Jerusalem wanting to execute Christians, and he arrived in Damascus wanting to be a Christian. He left Jerusalem despising the name of Jesus. He arrived in Damascus worshipping the name of Jesus. He left Jerusalem as the enemy of the church, and he arrived in Damascus wanting to join the church. And any reasonable person has to ask, what happened? What happened on the road, Paul? What was it that so affected Paul that made him reevaluate everything he believed in? Because, you know, religious extremists, they don't have a habit of sort of flip flopping around from faith to faith, do they? They are extreme in their beliefs, they are not easily persuaded. But Paul does a complete 180 while commuting from one city to another, and history pivots. What happened? Well, luckily, we don't need to guess. Because Paul's testimony is recorded in Acts for us by the historian Luke three times. Now, we we read about what happens on the road to Damascus in chapter 9, but later in the book, Paul gives his uh, testimony in different settings. I'm going to read you this testimony from Acts 26. Paul is now an apostle. He is traveling across Europe and modern-day Turkey, planting churches, preaching in synagogues, and telling anyone who will listen that Jesus is the Son of God and has good news for us all. And ironically... He's now the one being persecuted. He's on trial. And he's testifying about himself to the king of Judea, King Agrippa II, explaining how his life has changed. And he says this. He says, One day, I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priests. About noon, your majesty, I was on the road. A light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you've seen me. And tell them what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles or non-Jews to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. You see, Paul's story is actually pretty simple. He had a -a one-of-a-kind encounter with the resurrected Jesus. The Jesus who Paul proclaimed was dead appeared to him and asked him why he was persecuting him. And I know how that sounds to our rational minds. But you know, that is actually the point. Because Paul was a man of huge intellect and firm reason. You know, scholars spend years, their whole careers, studying his writings. He was no gullible fool. It was because of his rationality 
that when he encountered a man that he knew to be dead, appearing before him very much alive, arriving with a power that could only belong to God, that he did the only reasonable thing he could do. And he abandoned his beliefs and he gave his life to following Jesus. And do you know what? He knew that it wasn't a normal experience. Paul didn't say to others, hey, all you need to do is you, go, you start in Jerusalem, you walk to Damascus, and, and you'll meet Jesus on the road. He's about halfway along. Yeah? He didn't say that to people. He, he knew that he was a unique case, that God had a unique calling for him. No, no, no. His, his message, which he, he writes about in all of his letters, is very simple. Jesus Christ died on a cross for the sins of the world and three days later was raised to life. And I know it's true, he said, because I've met him. And now I can now see that all of the Old Testament points to him. Every prophecy spoken by God is fulfilled in Jesus. Every need we have is met in Jesus. And even more than that, the heart of God, the very heart of God, is revealed in Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. And that brings me to two last facts as I come to close this talk. Fact number four, Jesus transforms lives. The most important thing to know about Paul is that he had a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was not just an influence on his life, but indeed was the very source and sustenance of his life, transforming him from the inside out. Paul knew that in Jesus' death on the cross, his many heinous sins had been paid for. Through Jesus' self-sacrifice, Paul knew that God is not a God of hate and violence, but a God of compassion and mercy who laid down his life to rescue us from ourselves. Through Jesus' grace, Paul was changed to become like Jesus. He became compassionate instead of callous. He became merciful instead of murderous. He stopped taking others' lives, and instead, he laid down his own. Do you know, for a Jew... The worst way to die was on a cross. And not just because of the pain, which was horrendous, and not just because of the humiliation and shame, which was unbearable, but because when you died hung on wood or on a tree, in Jewish belief, you carried not just the curse of man, but indeed the curse of God. It was a sign that God had cursed you with his judgment. And that you were utterly wretched and to be utterly scorned. And yet, after his conversion, writing the first letter we have from Paul, he actually boasted about the crucifixion and identified with it, saying this. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live I live by faith in the Son of God who has loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus utterly transformed Paul from the inside out. And my last fact is this, fact number five. Jesus can transform your life too. There is nothing on earth like the power of the love of Jesus to change hearts. You know, governments can command people to do things through fear. We're seeing that in the news at the moment. Leaders can mislead people through lies. We know all about that. Religious leaders can control people through guilt and shame. And many of us will know about that too. But it's only Jesus Christ who says, whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. You will find life. We ask, well, why would I lose my life for his sake? Well, if like Paul, we become convinced That Jesus was not just a good moral teacher, but he really was God in human flesh. Speaking God's words. Demonstrating God's heart for us. Then it makes sense too that we would abandon whatever beliefs, rights and autonomy we have. In order to begin a new life built on knowing Jesus instead. There's a death to self and a rebirth in Christ. As Paul himself said, I consider everything a loss. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. That I may gain Christ and be found in him. Why lose your life for his sake? 
Why crucify your life? Because knowing Jesus is of surpassing worth. When you gain a relationship with God, everything you once held dear seems like nothing, like like garbage. When we relinquish control over our lives and our beliefs and our direction, and we put our faith in the person of Jesus Christ, he gives us his life, transforming us from the inside out, a life that we get now, we get to enjoy now, and that also stretches on into eternity. The good news of Jesus was not just for Paul. God worked through Paul's life as an ultimate demonstration of Jesus' love for us, for you and for me. Through Paul, God demonstrated that no one, hear me today, no one is beyond the love of God. You can't offend him too much that he cannot forgive you. You can't ignore him so much that he won't reveal himself to you. You can't head so far in one direction that God can't get hold of you and turn your life around in another. As Paul wrote to his trainee, Timothy, he said this, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King Eternal, Immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So let me ask you a final question. If Jesus turned the world upside down through his most avid persecutor, what can he do through you? Well, we're going to hear lots of stories today uh, in a video later on from those that are getting baptized who have experienced this transforming love of Jesus. But what we wanted to do is just give a chance just to hear one perhaps in in slightly more detail. And so um, I've invited Lee to come and share her story with us. Why don't you come, Lee? Let's give her some encouragement. She comes. (laughs) How are we doing? I think better than the first one. (laughs) Lee Lee gave her story at the nine o'clock meeting as well, which is great. Um, And just tell us before I ask you uh, the questions I prepared you on, um, how long have you been part of Welcome Church? Since December last year, so only pretty much this year. Fantastic. That's great. Well, um, let me ask you then, what was your life like before you met Jesus? Um, so in the first service, I wasn't as brave, and after listening to your message, I think I'm going to be a bit more brave this okay, time. Great. Um, so before knowing Jesus, it was hard. Um, it, was, it was really hard, and there was a lot of pain that I went through. Um, I experienced um, abuse in many forms, abduction, um, divorce, promiscuity, um, pretty much everything that anyone would consider to be ugly. Yeah. It was me. And so how did you then come to put your faith in Jesus? Um, I always knew him. Um, I grew up in a Christian family, so my my mum was a Sunday school teacher. I don't know what my dad did in the church, but he was there. And um, um, yeah, I always thought that that's just the way life was. And then suddenly they got divorced when I was nine, and I didn't understand. I mean, I thought you be a Christian, you don't get divorced, you do things right. And it just got worse and worse. And and after that, I just I started to really. get lost, and I started to put my trust and, and my value in, in the wrong things, and yeah, it was, it was really messy. Wow. Um, so what then was the moment for you of perhaps things turning around? Um, I think when, you, when you're in that position and you, you lie in your bed at night and you just hope someone will help you and you just, you know, you're praying to somebody, and I knew because I had been in a Christian family, I knew that there was somebody, and I prayed and I prayed, and Every time I hoped that some change would come, it did. And I started to think it, it can't just be coincidence. It has to be, it's not by chance, it's by choice. 
um, and and things started to get easier. And obviously, um, having my husband, who's been um, a devoted Christian for for much of of our time together, um, he started to explain things to me, and it just it just all made sense. Yeah. And I could feel the difference. Wonderful. So you started to grow in your faith as you reached out to God in prayer. Yeah. And felt him, him speaking to you through, through how your life started to change. Yeah. What difference has knowing Jesus made in your life? Um, I think the, the most valuable thing I've learned is, is gratitude. Um, I think it's very easy to look at um, how downtrodden we can be and how hard things can be. Um, and you do, you do wonder, why me? Um, and we're living in Scotland in 2015, and a, a bus drove past, and on the side of it, it said, um, instead of saying, why me, say, try me. And, um, and that's stuck in my head, and that's just, whenever things get difficult now, um, I've, yeah, I live with that, and gratitude is, yeah, is part of my life. Wonderful. Finally then, why are you getting baptised today? I know you want to read something for us. Definitely going to read it, otherwise I won't remember it all. Um, so I've waited a really long time for this, um, 16 years to be exact. I wanted to work through the messy world that I've had, the history that I've been through, and com compartmentalise it and deal with it and pray my way through it and heal. With this, I was really nervous and I couldn't figure out why. I put off the burning desire to do it because of an unexplained fear. A few weeks ago, my husband and I attended the baptism talk and Steve Pitch made a mention of it being much like a wedding and a marriage, and it suddenly all made sense. Commitment is really scary and overwhelming. Standing with everyone watching you <laughs> um, and completely transform your life is a terrifying thing. It's the feeling of knowing that you want it, but you don't quite know how to get there. So this is my love story. Much like the parable in the book of Luke, he wins the lost at any cost. He leaves the 99 to go after the one, and he came after me. I'm not a mistake. I'm not a problem. I'm not a burden, and I'm not a mess. I'm not a disaster, and I'm his. Wonderful. Let's give Lee some encouragement. Thank you. Thanks, Lee, for sharing your story with us so bravely. We really appreciate it. Well, I just want to say a couple more things before I finish, which is that if you're here today and, and you don't know what you believe about God, about Jesus, or about yourself, or maybe you've got mixed feelings about God, you, you've got some kind of faith, but you're not sure if he's altogether good, if you can trust him. Or maybe you just know there's something missing in your life, and if Jesus was the answer, you would want to know. I want to encourage you today to just simply ask Jesus to reveal himself to you. So in a moment, we're going to bow our heads in prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you want to, you can make that prayer your prayer. You can say it in your head. You can say it out loud. It's up to you. But I just want to lead us in a moment. So why don't we bow our heads? Just take a moment to connect with God. I'm going to pray. If you want to make this your prayer, then pray it after me. Lord Jesus, if you are real, then I want to know you too. If you are really God, and you really do want to know me, please reveal yourself to me. Make me as confident as Paul was that you are real, that I can lose my life for your sake and be transformed by your love. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you. We have uh, an Alpha course. Alpha is just a wonderful way, a uh, relaxed way, relational way to explore the Christian faith and questions about Jesus and Christianity. You'll get fed a meal. Um, you'll get uh, befriended by people. You'll get to know others. And you'll be able to ask any question and express any opinion. It's a really open environment. I want to recommend our Alpha course to you if you are exploring faith. But I do just want to say one more thing. Because finally, there will be many of us here who've already given our lives to Christ. And I want to say this to you. Please listen. If Paul's life teaches us anything at all, it should be that we should not write people off. Okay? We shouldn't write ourselves off. And we shouldn't write others off who haven't yet put their faith in Jesus. 
or who have walked away from faith. Paul discovered, hear me today, I know kids are coming in, kids are cute, I know. (laughs) But listen to me, this is important. Paul discovered in his own life the immense patience of Jesus, the patience of God to never give up. Christ who came not to save saints, but to save sinners. He is the King eternal. He is always at work, and no one is beyond his reach. So how can we write ourselves off? I can't do anything. God can't do anything through me. No, we can't do that. And how can we write others off? If Paul, the worst of sinners, can become a vessel for God's grace, then who do we know? Who are we rubbing shoulders with in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, who is going to be a vessel for God's grace too? Let's not write people off. Let's keep blessing people. Let's keep loving people. Let's keep serving people. Let's keep praying for people. Let's stay patient because our God has immense patience. Amen? Amen. Amen. Right. We're going to worship, and then we're going to get on with our baptisms. Wonderful. Do take your seats. It's lovely to see you. Hey, kids, have you had a good time in Welcome Kids this morning? (laughs) They're miles away. Was it good? Was it all right? Lovely. Thank you for coming back to join us. I'm glad that you are here. Now, we are going to be baptising seven people in this meeting. Uh, We baptised seven people in our last meeting as well, which is great. There's 14 today. And I'm going to ask those who are being baptised to head this way, if that's all right. Come on. Come on down, those of you being baptised, and let's give them a big welcome as they come. Come and and have a seat along the... Right on the front here, on the... Steps or in a battle somewhere. Yeah, that's great, Jenny. You go there. That's great. Lovely. That's good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's great. Yeah, we got room. We sneak you on. Fantastic. Oh, moving the translator. Thank you. Sorry, Wendy, to do that to you. Brilliant. Sign language continuing down here. Okay. Now, before we baptize these people, I would like to um, ex- take just a moment to explain what baptism is. Because, hey, you may be here today to support a friend or family member, a colleague perhaps, or or whatever. Thank you for coming. We're so delighted that you're here. Um, If I was in your situation, I would probably be wondering what's going on and be thinking, what are they doing then? What's all this about? Um, Well, let me just explain briefly what baptism is. The word baptize or baptism is not actually a religious word originally. It was originally a Greek word, and when the New Testament got translated... They didn't really translate it. They just carried it across into the English New Testament. The word in the Greek literally just means to be dipped or soaked or plunged or immersed. And so there's lots of water involved. And we've got a lovely baptism pool over here we're going to be using for that. But although the word is simple, there is a real meaning to what what, what we're doing as we baptize people. And to help you um, understand that, there's two ways I like to describe it. And those who are part of Welcome Church have heard me do this so many times. You know what I'm going to say, don't you, already, before I'm going to say it. And you should do. It's the day I do something different. It's the day you should worry. <laughs> okay. um, this, is what it's, uh, this is what I want you to think of this pool down here in two ways. Number one, it's a bath. It's like a bath. The Bible in Acts 22, 16 says, What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So one symbolism of baptism is it's like a bath with our sin being washed away. Now, in reality, it's not baptism that does that. It's Jesus who does that for us. He's the one that takes our sin, and we're credited with his righteousness. But one thing we're enacting here today is that washing, that forgiveness, an outward sign of an inward change. The second thing that we're enacting, the second meaning behind baptism is this. It's a bit more morbid. It's like a grave. So when they go down into that pool, it's like a bath. It's also like a grave. This is what the Bible says in Romans. It says, don't you know that... All who have been baptized into Christ Jesus are baptized into his death. We're buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with Jesus in a death like his, we'll certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And you know, the primary symbol of baptism isn't actually the washing, although that is there. The primary symbol is a burial and a resurrection. So it's like we're buried in baptism and raised to life again. And that's what we're enacting as well, our old life dead and our new life coming from Jesus. And as you 
heard when Lee spoke a few moments ago, I do often liken baptism to a wedding, and I'll explain it just a little bit. You see, there was a time when I didn't know my wife, um, and then there was a time she was just someone I'd heard of, and then I, I knew friends that knew her, and then I got to know her myself, and she became my girlfriend, and then eventually, once we knew, once I knew she was the one, we stood up in church in front of all our friends and family, and we got married, and we made promises to one another that we, this was for life, and that we were all in. And in just the same way, when we come to know Jesus, we go from not knowing about him to him being someone we've heard of, and then we might know people that know him, and we might get introduced to Jesus over time, and we come to think, oh, this is interesting. And then there comes a moment, a moment when perhaps we say this, we say, hey, I love Jesus, I'm all in, this is for life. And this is that moment to stand up <laughs> in church in front of your friends and family and make promises and say, I'm all in for Jesus. So that's what we're doing. You see they've all got their T-shirts on that say, all in. Those are yours to keep um, because that's what we're about. Why are they doing this? Because they're all in for Jesus. And I think it would be lovely now to hear a little bit um, from the guys that are being baptised. And so we're going to roll a short video. Thank you. Hi. My name is Crystal. And my name is David. I'm 14 years old. Hi there. I'm John. Hey, family. Call you. Hi, my name's Callum. Hi, my name's Caleb. Hello, my name is Teeny. Hi, my name's Elijah Campbell. Hi, my name's Talia. Hi, my name's Jennifer Nikai. Hi, my name is Toby. Did you hear about the kidnapping at school? It's all right, he woke up. I come from a Christian family and ever since I was young, I knew Jesus and I saw how much he loves me and that he answers my prayers. So that's why today I want to get baptized and follow him for the rest of my life. I absolutely love going to church, Sunday school and youth. And I gave my heart to Jesus at the age of about 13. I was always brought up in a Christian family and I always thought myself as a Christian. Um, but last year in high school, I got with a group of friends that I probably shouldn't have gone with. and. I started drifting away from God. So when I was very young, I was going for a walk one day and I just had this feeling that I should um, invite Jesus to live in my heart, so that's what I did. During a time of worship, something just clicked and I felt the need to give my life to God and that I needed him in my life. I had this insatiable desire and um, kind of a pursuit of people's adoration and attention and the more I chased after worldly success, I just found that I felt emptier and emptier. Um, there was this void that nothing, no trophy or no amount of money could ever fill. And uh, it led me to seeking more and, and wanting something constant and something more reliable and more real than um, material things. And this led me to, to Jesus. I realized that he'd been reaching out for me all along and it just was a matter of me taking a step in his direction. I remember one night I went to bed and I just gave my life to Jesus. I've grown up in a Christian family, so I've been going to church since I was a baby and I've believed in Jesus since. But more recently, in the past couple of years, I've been more committed to Jesus, more committed to following Jesus because he's made more of an impact on my life. I was brought up in a Christian household, born and raised, and quite recently I've decided that it's going to be my thing, not just my family's thing. I have grown up in a Christian family, so I'm not sure when I've become a Christian or how it's affected me since I did. But what I can say is I've been a Christian for a while now and that I know that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Saviour. I was raised a Catholic. Um, I was christened, did my Holy Communion, did my confirmation, but I never really had a relationship with God. I went to a youth group with a friend, just for the social aspect really. And we did an away day at another church. And it was during worship where I just felt so entirely overwhelmed. And I just had a moment of, you know, this is, this is real and this is someone that I want to have a relationship with. I personally went through a very dark um, period in my life, probably back of 2017, beginning of 2018. It was a point where I felt as if I wanted to get off this planet Earth and not be around anymore. I didn't grow up as a Christian. My first proper meeting with a Christian was my now husband. 
he suggested I do an Alpha course before we got married. So I did, but that didn't make me a Christian. It was a few years down the line and I had the most incredible, amazing dream where I saw heaven and I felt so joyful and peaceful, a peace that was out of this world. And I just knew from that moment that God was real and that he loved me. It's just kind of like always having a friend, always having someone in your corner, always having someone that cares about you, always having someone who wants what's best for you. I'm so much less of a warrior. I used to be quite a warrior. Um, so that's definitely changed. Jesus has given me the strength to separate myself from certain things or I can notice when things are perhaps not right. For me, I feel an overwhelming um, sense of peace. Uh, as a Christian, uh, we don't stop getting challenges uh, or experiencing challenges, um, but just that knowledge that I have God. God has changed my life so much for the better. Um, he's made me much less anxious about getting things right. I went to an encounter evening and I just felt the Holy Spirit overwhelm me and it was such an incredible feeling. And so that was when I really decided to get baptised. And singing for me is one way that I feel incredibly close to God, incredibly close to Jesus. And over the last three years I've been singing as part of a gospel choir. He transformed me, he changed me completely, he's um, given me new life, new perspective on things and it's just allowed me to be me. Um, I don't have to strive to be perfect anymore. It took me from being quite selfish to having a heart after people. So Jesus made so many differences in my life. He's made me more patient, more understanding, forgiving, and he's given me a real heart for people. I'm going to be baptised today because this is my decision as an adult to sort of declare to the world that this is the path I want to take, that I believe in Jesus. I am getting baptised today because I want to take my faith to the next level. I'd made the commitment and I feel like there's no reason to wait any longer because I'm all for Jesus and I'm ready to follow Jesus for the rest of my life and put him first. I'm getting baptised today because it says so in the Bible and yeah, I feel like it's the right time. I'm being baptised because I love Jesus and I am so ready to give my life to him and walk with him in this journey of life. Because I know that there is going to be love there uh, for me, no matter what, from Jesus. Um, and it's a fantastic feeling. I have been wanting, wanting to get baptised for a while, but now I really do feel like it's the right time and I feel like Jesus has told me it is the right time now. I'm getting baptised today because in the Bible it says you have to repent and be baptised and I want to do what the Bible says. And also it's an outward expression to show other people that I'm a Christian. My family and I started coming to Welcome Church this year uh, sometime in April and um, we were here for the baptism service and um, Pastor Steve said that they wouldn't stand in there because they were good but because they were forgiven. And um, I felt this overwhelming um, feeling come over me. And I just realized then that um, I'm not perfect, I'm flawed, and I can come as I am and make that public declaration to say that I'm all in. Yeah, I'm getting baptized just as another step in commitment to say, I want more of Jesus and less of me and um, yeah, I'm committing 100% to following him and, and living a life that brings him glory. That's about it. Well done guys. That's lovely. You'll have seen there, um, not just uh, the, these people here, but also uh, the, some from the other meeting there as well, who we baptised earlier, which is just 
which is just lovely. I didn't introduce myself, by the way. I'm Steve. I'm the lead pastor here at Welcome Church, and I do want to extend the real welcome to all of you who are new. Um, you will have heard a little quote there, um, which uh, was shared by Crystal. The, uh, the reality is baptism isn't for perfect people. It's not for good people. It is for forgiven people. And because you can sit with these, and know these people and go, how can they get baptized? They're not perfect. But no, they're not. It's for forgiven people. So how do we know if someone's ready to get baptized? There's three questions that I like to ask people before they get baptized. And we're going to do them today rather than do them individually in the water. We'll do them on math together. And uh, you'll be able to see their answers, which are supposed to be yes. Um, but as you listen, as I ask these questions, um, I want you to think about your own life as well, because if you can answer yes to these questions and you haven't been baptized, then this is for you as well. Okay, and these are the questions. They're an A, B, C, and the first one, A, admit. Guys, do you admit that you have sinned and need forgiveness from God? Yeah, it starts there. We need forgiveness. B, that's belief. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose to life again and that by faith in him you'll receive forgiveness and eternal life yeah that's good believing in jesus and a third one c is commit will you commit to follow jesus for the rest of your life wonderful okay those are the questions a b c commit believe commit and if you're in that position then we would love to baptize you as well but we can talk about that for another day okay uh, what we're going to do then is get on and baptize them okay so i'm gonna just so you know how we're gonna do this in in the water over here this is james and hannah why don't you climb on in james and hannah hannah works for us she's one of our operations assistants and james and hannah run lots of groups for our um uh, life groups for young people in our church and they're a real gift we love you guys and they're going to be doing the baptizing today thank you for doing this you promise not to drop anybody can i just check what about carl i'm slightly what yeah i'm slightly concerned okay but that's, that's fine. That means you'll sink. So we're in business. That's all good. It's all good. Okay. We're going to start today with Talia and Toby. Um, so let's get you guys to come on over. Now, as we... Yeah, give them a welcome. Now, families, when, when, uh, when your families, friends, colleagues, neighbors, whoever you are, it, when the person, people you know, person you know is getting baptized, feel free to come out and to take photos and to watch. I just ask you not to get away in, in the way of this device here because that's the camera and that means everyone can see, see. And we will put it on the screen so you can see each person. But feel free to come by if you want to take a photo. Once they've been baptized, what will happen is they'll head to the back of the hall with their towels. Um, and at that point, they, there'll be people there. We're going to pray for them. And we want to just take that moment to pray for each one. And again, if you're here thinking, oh, I really want to pray for so-and-so, because we're believing to God to bless them. We're believing for God to bless them, fill them with his Holy Spirit. God might speak to us with words for the, you know, encouragement and Bible verses for them. That's all going to happen over there as they're getting prayed for. And you, you, uh, if you know these guys can join in on that. These two are brother and sister. Um, Talia, why don't you step on in? And as you do this, we can do, do you first. And uh, I'll just say, do you know, Talia was nagging me whew, a couple of years ago about getting baptized. To be honest with you, we tend not to um, do this to kids are kind of year seven or so at school, that sort of age, maybe there and a bit older. Ta Talia is still not quite there, but she has for a while known that she wants to get baptized. Do you want your glasses on while you do it? Can I just check? Are you good with that? Yeah, that's good. Just pop them, that's up to you. Just pop them on the side. Look. Um, but Talia has been saying for ages, so I just want to honor Talia today for her patience because it's me that made her wait. All right. Um, nobody else. She'd, she'd have done this ages ago. Um, she's quite small. I think we might, we, hopefully we won't lose you off the step still. So uh, are you good to go? Okay, Talia, well done for your patience and well done for your persistence. And uh, Talia, having heard your confession of faith in Jesus, honestly, I'm delighted that we're baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wonderful. God bless you, Tanya. And Toby, why don't you go as well? Got a lovely, this is, a, this is older brother. We had the joy of baptizing Micah, who's older brother again, not that long ago. So this is Toby. How you doing, Toby? All good? Warm, warm enough? Yeah, it is 37 degrees in there. It's kind of body, it's like hot tub. We're hot tub ready in there. So uh, there we go. That's great. Toby. All good? 
Fantastic. I'll tell you, this is great to see Toby going on in faith, going on in God. We've seen that with our own eyes. So now this morning to hear your confession of faith in Jesus, it's now our privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Lovely. Now, um, that's great. They're going to get prayed for at the back of the room. I know people are going to want to get around them, pray for them, encourage them. And uh, if you feel stirred with you know, prophetic words for people, Bible verses, do make sure you give that to them today. Um, and we're trusting God to bless them, fill them with his Holy Spirit as well. Um, Jenny, we're going to do, do, uh, baptize Jenny next, our uh, next courageous baptizee. Come on down, Jenny. Let's welcome Jenny. doing well. Rich, you're going to come on? That's great. Well, if Rich is coming, we'll let you come on up with the towel and lovely. Okay. Can you see over the back there as well? Is that all right? I'll make sure kids can see and all of that. That's good. We're all good. We're good. Okay. Lovely. Jenny, well done. Courageous. Doing well. It's good. Uh, lovely getting to know you and Rich as well. You're a real blessing to our church and hearing your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, it's an absolute honour to baptise you in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Wonderful, that's great. We've got a good towel. Lovely. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we get you thoroughly prayed for as well? That is great. What an honour. Lovely. Right, next up is Crystal. Come on over, Crystal. Great hearing your stories there this morning as well, Crystal, isn't it? Met in the, all the encounters with Jesus and lovely, privileged to have you guys here. A little bit of a South African theme coming through this morning as well, in both meetings, which is absolutely delightful. And uh, that's great. And you're right, as you say, you stand there, not for good people, but forgiven people, right? And that includes you, Crystal. So it's an absolute privilege um, to do this. Crystal, and hearing your confession of faith in Jesus, we baptise you in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well done. That is great. Again, we're going to get you prayed for over the back. Let's get praying for Crystal. Tierney, you're next. Come on over. This is Tierney. Wonderful. Again, Exciting stuff, hearing all that God's been doing and hearing your testimony. <laughs> Lovely. That's good. Family, yeah, we're here. feel free to say, take whatever photos you want and get yourself in position. That's lovely. Are you all right? Is it warm? Are you all right? Are you warm enough? Yeah. No, you would be all right. Are you going? You can fall that way. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> You're in the right place. Lovely. Okay, James and Hannah, you all right? Lovely, Tierney, when hearing your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, it's a privilege to baptise you in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Wonderful. You got a nice towel? We don't want you getting cold. That's brilliant. Again, if you head towards the back, we're going to pray for you, Tierney. We want to make sure that you are blessed encouraged and prayed for this morning that's fantastic that's great people are going to go and join in with that okay you guys lee and carl let's have you both again we've got a husband wife duo going on here so uh that's great who's first carl all right carl first okay that's great go on in then carl that's brilliant this is carl's brother over here in case anyone can't spot the similarity that's going on so, uh, it's great. Are you ready? Fantastic. Right, again, you guys, such a blessing. We love having you here, both of you. Can I just say that? You're such a blessing to our church. We're delighted that you're here. Today we can test whether the baptism pool really is long enough. So, uh, we've been, we were assured by the architect when he designed this building, we could baptise an eight-footer in there without worrying about it. So, we're going to find out. Um, so, Carl, it's lovely to hear your confession of faith in Jesus. So we baptise you in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, that's great. Lovely. And Lee, let's, do, let's go for it, this one as well. Last one today. Last but not least, Lee. And thank you so much for giving your testimony in both meetings. I know you were nervous about that, but it did a fantastic job. Thank you. You've really blessed people today with that. So thank you. And so, uh, all right, all ready? Yeah, Lee, on hearing your confession of faith in Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, that is fantastic. Well done, guys. We are going to pray for you both. Again, if you head that way, we're going to get around you, pray for you, bless you, ask God to touch you, empower you with his Holy Spirit, and uh, that'll be wonderful. So you head that way. Again, feel free, life groups and things, feel free to go and pray for people. Um, wonderful. <laughs> Lovely. So hopefully you've heard a little bit from these guys and also those from the next meeting as well. I don't know if you caught what was said there at the end, uh, baptism, it's not for good people, it's for forgiven people, and I think that's so important. We understand what we're about. And so what I'm going to do, guys, I'm going to ask you, so if we don't fall over, I'm going to ask you um, three questions and uh, I'm going to do them together and everyone will be able to see your answers. So hopefully the answer is yes, because um, you know, that's why we're baptizing you. So th this is three questions we ask people before they get baptized. Are you ready? It's an ABC. First question is this, guys, do you admit that you have sinned and you need forgiveness from God? Yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay, second question. By the way, if you can answer yes to these questions, then maybe you should be getting baptized too, <laughs> if you haven't been. So A, do you admit that you've sinned and need forgiveness from God? They've said yes. B, believe. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sin and rose to life again, and that by faith in him, you receive forgiveness and eternal life? Wonderful. And last is C, is commit. Will you commit to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Wonderful. Then we are going to baptize these people. So that's really good. Let's crack on. Let's baptize them. And uh, oh, yeah. Okay, what we're going to do, I'm in the water over here. This is Henry and Joyce. We love Henry and Joyce. A lovely uh, part of our church. They lead one of the small groups in our church. How's the water? It's warm. Yeah, it's warm. It's good. It was 37 degrees yesterday. So uh, it's, we're, pretty, we're almost at hot tub. Another degree, it'd be good. Yeah, that'd be, that's fantastic. As we baptize each person, um, it might be family and things that you want to come and be nearby, and you absolutely can. So we're going to baptize them. As soon as they've been baptized, they will kind of head over to the back of the hall where they can be prayed for as well. We'd love people to pray for them. And it might be, as say, with especially some of these youth, some of our youth leaders might want to pray, or family members, you might just want to get around and pray for whoever it is that's been baptized. Um, so uh, that's how we're going to do it. So feel free to come and take photos. All we ask is if you could try and avoid getting in the way of the camera so everyone can see. And th this will show you in a minute. You'll be able to see the pool and be able to see everything that's going on from your seat as well. So the first, we're going to start with Callum and Jenna. So let's have you guys come this way. Callum and Jenna. These are, these are brother and sister. Really good. Well done. Callum, why don't you go first? Go on down into... That's it, you head on down. There's mum and dad coming as well. That's lovely. And uh, they're not the only guys today who have joined us from South Africa as well, who've uh, relocated countries and, and found us here in Woking and in this church, which is brilliant. Callum, how are you doing? Good, courageous going first today. That's good. I've really appreciated you doing that. So uh, you get yourself ready. That's it. That's it, guys. And Henry and Joyce will get hold of you. That's lovely. Then uh, Callum. All right, small but courageous. You ready? Callum, on hearing your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That's lovely. Hey, there we go. That's a good towel. Do you like that towel? That's a great towel. I love that. And Jenna, let's do you as well. We get these brother and sister. We'll baptize the two of them together. They're a lovely part of our youth group now. And uh, there we go. Jenna, you ready? Callum's led the way. Feeling brave? It's great. Well done. Lovely smile. Jenna, on hearing your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Wonderful. Now, guys, you're very welcome to watch some of the others, but I don't want you getting cold. So why don't you head that way and get yourself prayed for. Meanwhile, Caleb is coming this way. Come on over, Caleb. Let's have you over here. Fantastic. Your family coming as well. That's good. Feel free to take pictures, photos, whatever you like. That's great. Are you proud? Are you proud? It's good, isn't it? Exciting day. Exciting day. That's wonderful. I hope you guys are going to celebrate. And uh, it's good. You're blazing the way, my friend, for your family, aren't you? You feel like that? Blazing the way for your brothers and sisters. An exciting time. Caleb, your confession of faith in Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Wonderful. Well done, Caleb. And next is David. Okay, we can't... I'd say we're almost going in order of size here, if you noticed. I don't, it's, uh, that's not deliberate. <laughs> Go on in, David. Fantastic. Lovely. Yeah, you're coming up. That's great. You've got your camera. Here we go. His mum and dad coming to watch as well. That's lovely. Caleb. Feeling ready? Uh, sorry. <laughs> I do know, really, <laughs> despite appearances to the contrary, I do. Sorry. David. <laughs> Caleb's hopefully getting prayed for over there. That's great. Let's get some people around these guys. Let's get them prayed for over the back as well. I'm thoroughly prayed for. David, a wonderful name. I have a brother called David. He's all right. <laughs> hopefully you're all right too. Are you all right? Yeah, good. Right, David, um, on hearing your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, it's an absolute privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lovely. Hey! Now, I think we've got more water out than in at this point. <laughs> I blame the shorts. That's superb. Okay. Elijah, you're going to have to wade to get to the pool. Elijah, you're up next. That's great. Lovely. Well done. Dave and Faye, you come as well, that's great. Okay. Now, I have to tell you, Henry and Joyce, it's, it's been easy so far. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> we're going to have to go for this with some more enthusiasm. To get <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Lovely to hear, Elijah, lovely to hear you speaking on the video there as well about how your faith in Jesus has grown. And uh, you've got a, a great name, Elijah. May you take after the Elijah of the Bible in faith and great exploits and deeds for Jesus and hearing from God and bringing his word to others. And may that be your, your life. May God bless you as you do that. And Elijah, in hearing your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Lovely. Well done, Elijah. Okay, let's get them well and truly prayed for. We've got two left. John, John, you're next. All right, come on in, John. That's great. Lovely. Yeah, we can we got the towel? Yeah, it's great. Got the towel. Superb. Head on in there, John. That's great. Lovely. Now, I'll just say again, Henry Joyce, your challenge just went up again. All right. <laughs> that's great John you okay brilliant John it's lovely to see you here getting baptized it's been lovely again hearing you talk about Jesus today and uh, it's our privilege we've heard your confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so on hearing that faith in Jesus we baptize you in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit Amen <laughs> wonderful That is lovely. That's great. Do you get some good pics as well? Have we got some good photos? That's lovely. We'd love to get you prayed for. So uh, again, if you head towards the back, let's get some people around you, life group, whatever it is, let's get some people praying for John and asking uh, God to bless him as well. That's superb. That's the way. Squeeze the water out. <laughs> we never like the carpet anyway. Constantine, <laughs> come on over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't, don't dive in completely, you know, so just, just take it carefully there. Take it carefully. It's an absolute joy, again, to have uh, Constantine here getting baptised. 
And uh, it's not just South Africa that's being represented here today, is it, as well? So it's got... Uh, hey, Constantine, you going to shout out where you're from? Romania. Yes, fantastic. It's been a joy connecting with Constantine through all our CAP courses. Um, we've had the joy of doing Fresh Start and Life Skills, am I right, and the Money course. Yeah, yeah all of it. It's been wonderful to... Uh, to be able to bless and see that and to see the impact again that our social outreach has had and to connect with Constantine. So Constantine, um, wonderful to hear your confession of faith in Jesus. So on hearing your confession of faith, we baptise you in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> wonderful. Well done, Constantine. Let's get the towel around him. That is lovely. And uh, let's get you wrapped up. It's good. Constantine invited his landlord today to help us as well. Does this come with landlord duties? Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well done, everybody. That's great. If you head to the back, Constantine, people are going to pray for you. Thank you so much. Our worship team are coming up because uh, we're going to just worship once more in a moment and then we're going to finish and after we finish there'll be teas and there'll be coffees and there'll be pastries and there'll be uh, people arriving for the 11 o'clock meeting and children to collect from over there and all sorts of things to be done but just as we finish I want to finish with just before the band play I just want to finish with this last thing if you're here today and you're someone who has given your life to Jesus if you've decided to follow him and you have not after that decision, made the choice to be baptised, then I would want to encourage you that baptism is for you as well. I say it's not, for, it's not for perfect people. None of these people are here today because they're perfect. You know that. You know them. It's for forgiven people. And if you've given your life to Jesus, then baptism is also for you. And you can talk to us about that, and we can do that as well. But if you have not yet given your life to Jesus as well, I just want to remind you of that invitation that Chris gave at the end. You've seen today the impact and life transformation that can happen for people. And maybe you're curious about faith. Can I just encourage you as well to consider doing the Alpha course, whether that's here with us or in another church, maybe another town if you're just a guest today. Alpha runs all across the country and it's a great chance to ask about questions of life and faith. Let's stand together and we will um, worship Jesus.